The Scorch Trials, written by James Dashner. Chapter 1 She spoke to him before the world fell apart. Hey, are you still asleep? Thomas shifted in his bed, felt a darkness around him like air turned solid, pressing in. At first, he panicked. His eyes snapped open as if he imagined himself back in the box. That horrible cube of cold metal that had delivered him to the glade and the maze. But there was a faint light, and lumps of dim shadow gradually emerged throughout the huge room. Bunk beds, dressers, the soft breaths and gurgly snores of boys deep in slumber. Relief filled him. He was safe now, rescued and delivered to this dormitory. No more worries, no more grievers, no more death. Tom? A voice in his head, a girl's, not audible, not visible, but he heard it all the same, though never could he have explained to anyone how it worked. Exhaling a deep breath, he relaxed into his pillow, his razor-edged nerves settling down from that fleeting moment of terror. He spoke back, forming the words with his thoughts. Teresa, what time is it? No idea, she replied, but I can't sleep. I probably doze for an hour or so, maybe more. I was hoping you were awake to keep me company. Thomas tried not to smile. Even though she wouldn't be able to see it, it would be embarrassing all the same. Didn't give me much of a choice in the matter, did you? Kind of hard to sleep when someone's talking directly into your skull. Wah, wah. Go back to bed then. No, I'm good. He stared at the bottom of the bunk above him, featureless and darkly fuzzy in the shadow where Minho was currently breathing like a guy with ungodly amounts of phlegm lodged in his throat. What have you been thinking about? What do you think? Somehow she projected a jab of cynicism into the words. I keep seeing grievers, their disgusting skin and blubber bodies, all those metal arms and spikes. It was way too close for comfort, Tom. How are we going to get something like that out of our heads? Thomas knew what he thought. Those images would never leave. The gladers would be haunted by the horrible things that had happened in the maze for the rest of their lives. He figured that most, if not all, of them would have major psychological problems, maybe even go completely nutso. And above it all, he had one image burned into his memories as strongly as a branded mark from a searing hot iron, his friend Chuck, stabbed in the chest, bleeding, dying as Thomas held him. Thomas knew he would never forget that, but what he said to Teresa was, it'll go away, just takes a little time, that's all. You're so full of it, she said. I know. How ridiculous was it that he loved hearing her say something like that to him? That her sarcasm meant things were going to be okay. You're an idiot, he told himself, then hoped she didn't hear that thought. I hate that they separated me from you guys, she said. Thomas understood why they had, though. She was the only girl, and the rest of the gladers were teenage boys, a bunch of shanks they didn't trust yet. Guess they were protecting you. Yeah, I guess. Melancholy seeped into his brain with her words stuck to them like syrup. But it sucks being alone after everything we went through. Where'd they take you anyway? She sounded so sad that he almost wanted to get up and look for her, but he knew better. Just on the other side of that big common room where we ate last night. It's a small room with a few bunks. I'm pretty sure they locked the door when they left. See, told you they wanted to protect you. Then he quickly added, Not that you need protecting. I'd put my money on you against at least half these shanks. Only half? Okay, three quarters, including me.
A long stretch of silence followed, though somehow Thomas could still sense her presence. He felt her. It was almost like how, even though he couldn't see Minho, he knew his friend lay only a few feet above him. And it wasn't just the snoring. When someone is close by, you just know it. Despite all the memories of the last few weeks, Thomas was surprisingly calm, and soon sleep overpowered him once more. Darkness settled on his world, but she was there, next to him in so many ways, almost touching. He had no concept of time passing while in that state. Half asleep, half enjoying her presence, and the thought that they'd been rescued from that horrible place, that they were safe, that he and Teresa could get to know each other all over again, that life could be good. Blissful sleep, hazy darkness, warmth, a physical glow almost floating. The world seemed to fade away. All became numb and sweet, and the darkness somehow comforting. He slipped into a dream. He's very young, four, maybe five, lying in a bed with his blankets pulled to his chin. A woman sits next to him, her arms folded in her lap. She has long brown hair, a face just beginning to show the signs of age. Her eyes are sad. He knows this even though she's trying very hard to hide it with a smile. He wants to say something, ask her a question, but he can't. He's not really here, just witnessing it all from a place he doesn't quite understand. She begins to talk, a sound so simultaneously sweet and angry, it disturbs him. I don't know why they chose you, but I do know this. You're special somehow. Never forget that. And never forget how much... Her voice cracks, and tears run down her face. Never forget how much I love you. The boy replies, but it's not really Thomas speaking, even though it is him. None of this makes any sense. Are you going to be crazy like all those people on TV, Mommy? Like, Daddy? The woman reaches out and runs her fingers through his hair. Woman? No, he can't call her that. This is his mother. His mommy. Don't you worry about that, honey, she says. You won't be here to see it. Her smile has gone away. Too fast, the dream faded into blackness, leaving Thomas in a void with nothing but his thoughts. Had he seen another memory crawl up from the depths of his amnesia? Had he really seen his mom? There'd been something about his dad being crazy. The ache inside Thomas was deep and gnawing, and he tried to sink further into oblivion. Later, how much later he had no idea, Teresa spoke to him again. Tom, something's wrong. Chapter 2 That was how it started. He heard Teresa say those three words, but it seemed from far away, as if spoken down a long and cluttered tunnel. His slumber had become a vicious liquid, thick and sticky, trapping him. He became aware of himself, but realized he was removed from the world, entombed by exhaustion. He couldn't wake up. Thomas! She screamed it a piercing rattle in his head. He felt the first trickle of fear, but it was more like a dream. He could only sleep. And they were safe now, nothing to worry about anymore. Yeah, it had to be a dream. Teresa was fine, they were all fine. He relaxed again, let himself drown in slumber. Other sounds snuck their way into his consciousness. Thumps the clang of metal against metal, something shattering, boys shouting, more like the echo of shouts, very distant, muted. Suddenly, they became more like stream screams, unearthly cries of anguish, but still distant. 
as if he'd been wrapped in a thick cocoon of dark velvet. Finally, something pricked the comfort of sleep. This wasn't right. Teresa had called for him, told him something was wrong. He fought the deep sleep that had consumed him, clawed at the heavy weight pinning him down. Wake up, he yelled at himself. Wake up! Then something disappeared from inside him. There one instant, gone the next. He felt as if a major organ had just been ripped from his body. It had been her. She was gone. Teresa? He screamed out with his mind. Teresa, are you there? But there was nothing, and he no longer felt that comforting sense of her closeness. He called her name again, then again, as he continued to struggle against the dark pole of sleep. Finally, reality swept in, washed away the darkness. Engulfed in terror, Thomas opened his eyes and shot to a sitting position on his bed, scooted out until he got his feet under him and jumped up, looked around. Everything had gone crazy. The other gladers in the room were running around, shouting, and terrible, horrible, awful sounds filled the air, like the wretched squeals of animals being tortured. There was fry pan pointing out a window, his face pale. Newt and Minho were running to the door. Winston, hands held up to his frightened, acne-plagued face, like he'd just seen a flesh-eating zombie. Others stumbling over each other to look out the different windows, but keeping their distance from the glass. Achingly, Thomas realized he didn't even know most of the names of the twenty boys who'd survived the maze, an odd thought to have in the middle of all that chaos. Something at the corner of his eye made him turn to look toward the wall. What he saw immediately wiped away any peace and safety he'd felt talking to Teresa in the night, made him doubt such emotions could even exist in the same world in which he now stood. Three feet from his bed, draped by colorful curtains, a window looked out into a bright, blinding light. The glass was broken. Jagged shards leaned against crisscross steel bars. A man stood on the other side, gripping the bars with bloody hands. His eyes were wide and bloodshot, filled with madness. Sores and scars covered his thin, sunburnt face. He had no hair, only diseased splotches of what looked like greenish moss. A vicious slit stretched across his right cheek. Thomas could see teeth through the raw, festering wound. Pink saliva dribbled in swaying lines from the man's chin. I'm a crank! The horror of a man yelled. I'm a bloody crank! And then he screamed, and then he started screaming two words over and over and over, split, spit flying with every shriek. Kill me! Kill me! Kill me! Chapter 3 A hand slammed down on Thomas's shoulder from behind. He cried out and spun around to see Minho staring past him at the maniac screaming through the window. They're everywhere, Minho said. His voice had a gloom to it that perfectly matched how Thomas felt. It seemed as if everything they dared hope for the previous night had dissolved to nothing. And there's no sign of the shanks who rescued us, he added. Thomas had lived in fear and terror the past few weeks, but this was almost too much. To feel safe, only to have that snatched away again. Shocking even himself, though he quickly set aside that small part of him that wanted to jump back into his bed and bawl his eyes out. He pushed away the lingering ache of remembering his mom and the stuff about his dad and people going crazy. Thomas knew that someone had to take charge. They needed a plan if they were going to survive this, too. Have any of them gotten in yet, he asked, a strange calm washing over him. Do all the windows have these bars? 
Minho nodded toward one of the many lining the walls of the rectangular room. Yeah, it was too dark to notice them last night, especially with those stupid frilly curtains, but I'm sure glad for them. Thomas looked at the gladers around them, some running from window to window to get a look outside, others huddling in small groups. Everyone had a look of half disbelief, half terror. Where's Newt? Right here. Thomas turned to see the older boy, not knowing how he'd missed him. What's going on? You think I have a bloody clue? Bunch of crazies want to eat us for breakfast by the looks of it. We need to find another room, have a gathering. All this noise is driving nails through my buggin' skull. Thomas nodded absently. He agreed with the plan, but hoped New and Minho would take care of it. He was eager to make contact with Teresa. He hoped her warning had just been part of a dream, a hallucination from the drug of deep and exhausted slumber, in that vision of his mom. His two friends moved away, calling out and waving their arms to collect gladers. Thomas took a tremulous glance back at the shredded madman at the window, then looked away immediately, wishing he hadn't reminded his brain of the blood and torn flesh, the insane eyes, the hysterical screaming. Kill me! Kill me! Kill me! Thomas stumbled to the farthest wall, leaned heavily against it. Teresa, he called out again with his mind. Teresa, can you hear me? He waited, closing his eyes to concentrate, reaching out with invisible hands, trying to grasp some trace of her. Nothing, not even a passing shadow or brush of feeling, much less a response. Teresa, he said more urgently, clenching his teeth with the effort, where are you? What happened? Nothing. His heart seemed to slow until it almost stopped and he felt like he'd swallowed a big, hairy lump of cotton. Something had happened to her. He opened his eyes to see the gladers gathered around the green-painted door that led to the common area where they'd eaten pizza the night before. Minho was jerking on the brown brass, the round brass handle to no avail, locked. The only other door was to a shower and locker room, from which no other exits existed. There was that in the windows, all with those metal bars, thank goodness. Each one had raging lunatics screaming and yelling on the other side. Even though worry ate at him like spilled acid in his veins, Thomas gave up momentarily on trying to contact Teresa and join the other gladers. Newt was having a go at the door with the same useless result. It's locked, he muttered, when he finally gave up, his arms falling weakly to his sides. Really, genius, Minho said, his powerful arms folded and tensed, veins bulging all over the place. Thomas thought for a split second he could actually see the blood pumping through them. No wonder you were named after Isaac Newton. Such an amazing ability to think. Newt wasn't in the mood. Or maybe he just learned long ago to ignore Minho's smart aleck remarks. Let's break this bloody handle off. He looked around as if he expected someone to give him a sledgehammer. I wish those shuck cranks would shut up, Minho yelled, turning to glower at the closest one, a woman who looked even more hideous than the first man Thomas had seen. A bleeding wound crossed her face ending on the side of her head. Cranks, Frypan repeated. The hairy cook had been silent until then, barely noticeable. Thomas thought he looked even more frightened than when they'd been about to, bat about to battle gr the grievers to escape the maze. Maybe this was worse. When they'd settled into bed last night, everything had seemed good and safe. Yeah, maybe this was worse to have that suddenly taken away. Minho pointed at the screaming, bloody woman. That's what they keep calling themselves, haven't you heard it? 
I don't care if you call them pussy willows, Newt snapped. Find me something to break through this stupid door. Here, a shorter boy said, carrying a slender but solid fire extinguisher he'd taken off the wall. Thomas remembered seeing it earlier. Again, he felt guilty for not even knowing the kid's name. Newt grabbed the red cylinder, ready to pile drive the door handle. Thomas stood as close as he could, eager to see what was on the other side of the door, though he had a very bad feeling that whatever it was, they were not going to like it. Newt lifted the extinguisher, then slammed it down on the round brass handle. The loud crack was accompanied by a deeper crunch, and then it took only three more whacks before the entire unit of the handle crashed to the floor with a jangle of broken metal pieces. The door inched outward, cracked open just enough to show darkness on the other side. Newt stood quietly, staring at that long, narrow gap of blackness as if he expected demons from the underworld to come flying through. Absently, he handed the extinguisher back to the boy who'd found it. Let's go, he said. Thomas thought he heard the slightest quaver in his voice. Wait, Frypan called out. We sure we want to go out there? Maybe that door was locked for a reason. Thomas couldn't help but agree. Something felt wrong about this. Minho stepped up to stand right next to Newt. He looked at Frypan, then made eye contact with Thomas. What else are we going to do? Sit here and wait for those loonies to get in? Come on! Those freaks aren't breaking through the window bars anytime soon, Frypan retorted. Let's just think for a second. Time for thinking's done, Minho said. He kicked out with his foot and the door swung completely open. If anything, it seemed to grow even darker on the other side. Plus, you should have spoken up before we blasted the lock to bits, Slinthead. Too late now. I hate when you're right. Frypan grumbled under his breath. Thomas couldn't quit staring past the open door into the pool of inky darkness. He felt a now all too familiar clench of apprehension, knowing that something had to be wrong or the people who'd rescued them would have come for them long time ago. But Minho and Newt were right. They had to go out there and find some answers. Shuck it, Minho said. I'll go first. Without waiting for a response, he walked through the open door, his body vanishing in the gloom and almost instantly. Newt gave Thomas a hesitant look, then followed. For some reason, Thomas thought it should be up to him to go next, so he did. Step by step, he left the dorm room and entered the darkness of the common area, hands reaching out in front of him. The glow of light coming from behind didn't do much to illuminate things. He might as well have been walking with his eyes squeezed shut. And the place smelled horrible. Minho yelped up ahead, then called back, Whoa, be careful. Something weird's hanging from the ceiling. Thomas heard a slight squeak or groan, something creaking, as if Minho had bumped into a low-hanging chandelier sending it swaying back and forth. A grunt from Newt somewhere to the right was followed by the squeal of a metal dragging across the floor. Table, Newt announced. Watch out for tables. Frypan spoke up behind Thomas. Does anyone remember where the light switches were? That's where I'm heading, Newt responded. I swear, I remember seeing a set of them somewhere over here. Thomas continued walking blindly forward. His eyes had adjusted a little, where before everything had been a wall of blackness, now he could see traces of shadows against shadows. Yet something was off. He was still a little disoriented, but things seemed to be in places they shouldn't be. It was almost as if... Blah! Ha, ha, Minho groaned, a shudder of repulsion like he'd just stepped in a pile of clunk. Another creaking sound cut through the room. Before Thomas could ask what had happened, he bumped him into something himself, hard, awkwardly shaped, 
the feeling of cloth. Found it, Newt shouted. A few clicks were heard. Then the room suddenly blazed with fluorescent lights, temporarily blinding Thomas. He stumbled away from the thing he bumped into, rubbing his eyes, ran into another stiff figure, sent it swaying away from him. Whoa! Minho yelled. Thomas squinted. His vision cleared. He forced himself to look at the scene of horror around him. Throughout the large room, people hung from the ceiling. At least a dozen. They'd all been strung up by the neck. The ropes twisted and trenched into purple, bloated skin. The stiff body swung to and fro, ever so slightly, pale pink tongues lolling out of their white-lipped mouths. All of them had eyes open, though glazed over with certain death. By the looks of it, they'd been that way for hours. Their clothes and some of their faces looked familiar. Thomas dropped to his knees. He knew these dead people. They were the ones who'd rescued the Gladers just the day before. Chapter 4 Thomas tried not to look at any of the dead bodies as he stood up. He half walked, half stumbled over to Newt, who was still by the bank of the light switches, his terrified gaze darting between the corpses hanging throughout the room. Minho joined them, swearing under his breath. Other gladers were emerging from the dorm room, shouting as they were realized what they were seeing. Thomas heard a couple of them throw up, gagging and spitting. He felt the sudden urge himself, but fought it. What had happened? How could everything be taken away from them so fast? His stomach tightened up as despair threatened to bowl him over. Then he remembered Teresa. Teresa! He called out with his mind. Teresa! Again and again, mentally screaming it with his eyes closed and jaw clenched. Where are you? Tommy, Newt said, reaching out to squeeze his shoulder. What's bloody wrong with you? Thomas opened his eyes, realized he was doubled over, arms wrapping around his stomach. He slowly straightened trying to push away the panic, eating him inside. What? What do you think? Look around us. Yeah, but you looked like you were in pain or something. I'm fine. Just trying to reach her in my mind, but I can't. He wasn't fine. He hated reminding the others that he and Teresa could speak telepathically. And if all these people were dead, we've got to find where they put her. He blurted out, grasping urgently for a task to clear his mind. He scanned the room, trying his best not to focus on the corpses, looking for a door that might lead to her room. She'd said it was across the common area from where they'd all slept. There, a yellow door with a brass handle. He's right, Minho said to the group. Spread out. Find her. Might have already. Thomas was on the move surprised at how quickly he'd recovered his senses. He ran toward the door, dodging tables and bodies. She had to be in there, safe like they had been. The door was closed. That was a good sign. Probably locked. Maybe she'd fallen into a deep sleep like him. That was why she'd been so quiet, unresponsive. He had almost reached the door when he remembered that they might need something to break into the room. Someone grab that fire extinguisher, he yelled over his shoulder. The smell in the common area was horrendous. He gagged as he sucked in a deep breath. Winston, go get it, Minho ordered behind him. Thomas reached the door first and tried the handle. It didn't budge, locked tight. Then he noticed a small, clear plastic display hanging on the wall to the right, about five inches square. A sheet of paper had been slipped into the thin slot, several words typed on its surface. Teresa Agnes, Group A, Subject A1, The Betrayer. Oddly, the thing that stood out most to Thomas was Teresa's last name, or at least 
what appeared to be her last name, Agnes. He didn't know why, but it surprised him. Teresa Agnes. He couldn't think of anyone within the splotchy knowledge of history floating in his still scarce memories who matched that name. He himself had been renamed after Thomas Edison, the great inventor. But Teresa Agnes? He'd never heard of her. Of course, all their names were more of a joke than anything, probably a callous way for the creators, wicked, or whoever had done this to them, to distance themselves from the real people they'd stolen from real mothers and fathers. Thomas couldn't wait until the day he'd learned what he'd been called at birth, what name lay stamped in the minds of his parents, whoever they were, wherever they were. The sketchy memories he initially regained from going through the changing had made him think that he didn't have parents who loved him, that whoever they were, they didn't want him, that, they, that he'd been taken from horrible circumstances. But now he refused to believe it, especially after having dreamed about his mom during the night. Minho snapped his fingers in front of Thomas's eyes. Hello? Calling Thomas? Not a good time to daydream. Lots of bodies. Smells like fry pants pits. Wake up. Thomas turned to him. Sorry. Just thought it was weird that Teresa's last name was Agnes. Minho clicked his tongue. Who cares about that? What's this freaking stuff about her being the betrayer? And what's Group A, Subject A1 mean? This was Newt who handed over the fire extinguisher to Thomas. Anyway, your turn to break a bug and door handle. Thomas grabbed it, suddenly angry at himself for wasting even a few seconds about thinking about that stupid label. Teresa was in there, and she needed their help. Trying not to be bothered by the word betrayer, he grabbed the cylinder and slammed it against the brass knob. A jolt! ran up his arms as the clang of metal against metal ran through the air. He'd felt it give a little, and two smashes later the handle fell off and the door popped open an inch or two. Thomas threw the extinguisher to the side and grabbed the door, swung it all the way out. Itchy anticipation mixed with dread at what he might find. He was the first to step into the lighted room. It was a smaller version of the boys' dorm. Just four bunk beds, two dressers, and a closed door, presumably leading to another bathroom. All the beds were made up nicely except one, its blankets tossed to the side and a pillow hanging off the edge. The sheet rumpled. But there was no sign of Teresa. Teresa? Thomas called out, his throat straining with panic as he yelled. The swirly, swishing sound of a toilet flushing came through the closed door and a sudden relief burst through Thomas. It was so strong, he almost had to sit down. She was there. She was safe. He steadied himself and started walking toward the bathroom, but Newt reached out and grabbed his arm. You're used to living with a bunch of boys, Newt said. I don't think it's polite to go stomping into the bloody ladies' room. Just wait till she comes out. Then we need to get everybody in here and have a gathering, Minho added. It doesn't stink in here, and there aren't any windows for cranks to scream at us. Thomas hadn't noticed the lack of windows until that moment, though it should have been the most obvious thing, considering the chaos of their own dorm rooms. Cranks. He'd almost forgotten. I wish she'd hurry up, he murmured. I'll get everyone over here, Minho said. He turned and walked back toward the common area. Thomas stared at the bathroom door. Newt and Frypan and a few other gladers pushed their way into the room and took seats up on the beds, all of them leaning forward, elbows on knees, rubbing their hands together absently, the anxiety and worry evident in their body language. Teresa, Thomas said in his mind, can you hear me? We're waiting for you out here. No response, and he still felt that bubble of emptiness as if her presence itself had been permanently taken away. There was a click. The handle on the door to the bathroom turned, 
Then the door opened, swinging toward Thomas. He stepped forward, ready to pull Teresa into a hug. He didn't care who was there to see it. But the person who walked into the dorm room wasn't Teresa. Thomas stopped mid-stride and almost tripped. Everything inside him seemed to fall. It was a boy. He wore the same kind of clothes they'd all been given the night before. Clean pajamas with a button-up shirt and flannel pants, light blue. He had olive skin, and his dark hair was cut surprisingly short. The look of innocent surprise on his face was the only thing that prevented Thomas from grabbing the shank by the collar and shaking him until some answers came out. Who are you? Thomas asked, not caring that the words sounded harsh. Who am I? The boy responded, somewhat sarcastically. Who are you? Newt had gotten back to his feet, actually standing even closer to the new guy than Thomas was. Don't bloody mess around. There are a lot more of us than there are of you. Tell us who you are. The boy folded his arms, a defiance coming over his whole body. Fine. My name's Eris. What else you want to know? Thomas wanted to punch the guy. Him acting all high and mighty while Teresa was missing? How'd you get here? Where's the girl who slept here last night? Girl? What girl? I'm the only one here, and it's been that way since they put me here last night. Thomas turned to point back in the direction of the common area. There's a sign right out there that says this is her room. Teresa. Agnes. No mention of a shank named Eris. Something in his tone must have made the boy realize this wasn't a joke. He held his hands in a consolatory gesture. Look, man. I don't know what you're talking about. They put me in here last night. I slept in that bed. He pointed to the one with the rumpled sheet and blanket. And I woke up about five minutes ago and took a pee. Never heard the name Teresa Agnes in my life. Sorry. The brief moment of relief Thomas had felt when he'd heard the toilet flush officially shattered. He, looked, he shared a look with Newt, not knowing what to ask next. Newt shrugged slightly, then turned back to Eris. Who put you here last night? Eris threw his arms up in the air, then let them come back down and slap against his sides. I don't even know, man. A bunch of people with guns who rescued us. They told us everything would be okay now. Rescued you from what? Thomas asked. This was getting weird. Really, really weird. Eris looked down at the floor and his shoulders fell. It looked as if a wave of some terrible memory had washed over him. He sighed, then finally looked up at Thomas and answered, From the maze, man. From the maze. Chapter 5 Something softened in Thomas. The kid wasn't lying. He could just tell. The look of horror that had taken hold of Eris was one he knew well. Thomas had felt it himself and had seen it on too many other faces. He knew exactly what kind of terrible memories made someone look like that. He also knew that Eris had no clue what had happened to Teresa. Maybe you should sit down, Thomas said. I, I think we have a lot to talk about. What do you mean? Eris asked. Who are you guys? Where did you come from? Thomas let out a slight laugh. The maze, the grievers, wicked, you name it. So much had happened. Where could he start? Not to mention that worry over Teresa was making his head spin, making him want to run out of the room and search for her immediately. But he stayed. You're lying, said Eris, his voice having dropped to a whisper, his face now a full shade paler. No, we're not, Newt responded. Tommy's right. We need to talk. Sounds like we've come from similar places. Who's that guy? Thomas turned around to see that Minho had returned, a pack of gladers standing behind him on the other side of the doorway. Their faces were scrunched up in disgust at the smell out there, their eyes still full of terror of seeing what filled the room just behind them. Minho, 
Meet Eris, Thomas said, taking a step to the side and gesturing toward the other boy. Eris, meet Minho. Minho stuttered out a few unintelligible words, as if he couldn't quite decide where to start. Look, Newt said, let's take down these top beds and move them around the room. Then we can all sit and figure out what's bloody going on. Thomas shook his head. No. First, we need to go find Teresa. She must be in some other room. Isn't one, Minho said. What do you mean? I just checked this whole place out. There's the big common area, this room, our dorm room, and some seriously shucked doors that lead outside, where we came in from the bus yesterday, locked and chained from the inside. Doesn't make any sense, but I don't see any other doors or exits. Thomas shook his head in confusion. It felt like a million spiders had just spun cobwebs through his brain. But what about last night? Where'd the food come from? Didn't anyone notice other rooms? A kitchen? Anything? He looked around, hoping for an answer, but no one said a word. Maybe there's a hidden door, Newt finally said. Look, we can only do one thing at a time. We need to... No, Thomas shouted. We've got all day to talk to this heiress guy. The label by the door said Teresa should be here somewhere. We need to find her. Without waiting for a response, he headed for the door back to the common area, pushing his way past boys until he was through. The smell hit him as if a bucket of raw sewage had been spilled over his head. The bloated and purple bodies hung like carcasses of game set out by hunters to dry. Their lifeless eyes stared back at him. A familiar, sickening tickle of revulsion filled his stomach and triggered his gag reflex. Closing his eyes for a second, he willed his insides to settle. When they finally did, he began his search for some sign of Teresa, concentrating with all his might on not looking at the dead people. But then, a horrible thought struck him. What if she... He ran through the room, searching the faces of the bodies. None of them was her. Relief dissolved the fleeting moment of panic, and he focused on the room itself. The walls surrounding the common area were as plain as could be, smooth plaster painted white, no decoration of any kind, and for some reason, no windows. He walked quickly around its entire circumference, running his left hand along the wall as he did so. He came to the door of the boys' dorm room, went past it, then made it to the big entrance through which they'd come the day before. There had been a torrential downpour at the time, which seemed impossible now, considering the bright sun he'd, been, he'd seen shining behind the crazy man earlier. The entrance or exit, consisted of two large steel doors, their surfaces a shiny silver, and just like Minho said, a massive chain, with links a full inch thick, had been threaded through the handles on the doors and pulled tight. Two big key locks snapped shut to keep it that way. Thomas reached out and pulled on the chains to check their strength. The metal felt cool under his hands, and it didn't give at all. He expected thumps from the other side, cranks trying to get in just as they were at the windows in the dorm room, but the room remained silent. The only sounds were muted and coming from the two dorms, distant shouts and screams from the cranks, and murmurs of conversations from the gladiators. Frustrated, Thomas continued his trek along the walls until he made it back to the room that was supposed to be Teresa's. Nothing not even a crack or seam to indicate another exit. The large room wasn't even a square. It was a big oval, round and cornerless. He was completely perplexed. He thought back to the night before, when they'd all sat there and eaten pizza like the starved people they had been. Surely they'd seen other doors, a kitchen, something. But the more he thought about it, 
The more he tried to picture what things had looked like, the fuzzier it became. An alarm went off in his head. Their brains had been tinkered with before. Had it happened again? Had their memories been altered or wiped? And what had happened to Teresa? Desperate, he thought about crawling across the floor to look for a trap door or something, some clue to what had happened. But he couldn't spend another minute with all those rotting bodies. The only thing left was the new kid. He sighed and turned back to the small room where they'd found him. Eris had to know something that would help. Just as Newt had ordered, the top bunks had been unhooked from the lower ones and placed around the room against the walls, creating enough space for the 19 other gladers and Eris to sit in a circle, everyone facing each other. When Minho saw Thomas, he patted an empty spot next to him. Told you, dude. Have a seat and let's talk. We waited on you, but close that shuck door as much as you can first. Smells worse than Galley's rotting feet out there. Without responding, Thomas pulled the door shut, then walked over and sat down. He wanted to sink his head into his hands, but he didn't. Nothing indicated for sure that any kind of danger threatened Teresa. Something weird was going on, but there could be a million explanations, and plenty of them included her being okay. Newt was one bed to the right, sitting so far forward that just the edge of his butt rested on the mattress. All right, let's get started on the bloody storytelling so we can get to the real problem, finding something to eat. Right on cue, Thomas felt a hunger pang, heard his stomach growl. That problem hadn't even occurred to him yet. Water would be fine. They had the bathrooms. But there was no sign of food anywhere. Good that, Minho said. Talk, Eris. Tell us everything. The new boy was directly across the room from Thomas. The glader sitting to each side of the stranger had scooted to the far end of the beds. Eris shook his head. No way. You guys go first. Yeah, Minho responded. How about y'all just take turns beating the living clunk out of your shuck face, and then we'll ask you to talk again. Minho, Newt said sternly, there's no reason. Minho pointed sharply at Eris. Please, dude. For all we know, this shank could be one of the creators. Somebody from Wicked, here to spy on us. He could have killed those people out there. He's the only one we don't know, and the doors and windows are locked. I'm sick of him acting all snooty when we've got 20 guys to his one. He should talk first. Thomas groaned on the inside. One thing he knew was that the kid would never open up if Minho terrified him. Newt sighed and looked over at Eris. He's got a point. Just tell us what you meant about coming from the bug and maze. That's where we escaped from, and we obviously haven't met you. Eris rubbed his eyes, then met Newt's glaze. Gaze. Fine. Listen. I was thrown into this gigantic maze made out of huge stone walls. But before that, my memory was erased. I couldn't remember anything about my life from before. I just knew my name. I lived there with a bunch of girls. They, there must have been 50 of them, and I was the only boy. We escaped a few days ago. The people who helped us kept us in a big gym for a few days, then moved me here last night. But no one explained anything. What's this stuff about you being in a maze, too? Thomas barely heard the last few words of what Eris had said over the sounds of surprise coming from the other gladers. Confusion swirled his brain in his brain. Eris had announced what he'd been through as simply and quickly as describing a trip to the beach but it seemed crazy. Monumental, if true. Luckily, someone had voiced exactly what Thomas was trying to sort out in his mind. Wait a minute, Newt said. You lived in a big maze, on a farm, where walls closed every night? Just you and a few dozen girls? Were the creatures called grievers? Were you the last one to arrive? And did everything go bugging nuts when you did? Did you come in a coma? 
with a note that said, you were the last one ever? Whoa, 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 Eris was saying, even before Newt had finished. How do you know all of this? How? It's the same shuck experiment, Minho said, the earlier belligerence gone from his voice. Or same whatever. But they had all girls and one boy. We had all boys and one girl. Wicked must have built two of those mazes, run two different tests. Thomas's line, line of thinking had already accepted that. He finally settled him enough to speak. He looked at Eris. Did they call you the trigger? Eris nodded, obviously as perplexed as anyone else in the room. And could you? Thomas began, but hesitated. He felt like every time he brought this up, he was admitting to the world that he was crazy. Could you speak to one of those girls inside your mind? You know, like telepathically? Eris's eyes widened, staring deeply at Thomas as if he'd understood a dark secret that only someone else who shared it could understand. Can you hear me? The phrase appeared so clearly inside Thomas's mind that at first he thought Eris had spoken out loud. But no. His lips hadn't moved. Can you hear me? The boy repeated. Thomas hesitated, swallowed. Yes. They killed her, Eris said back to him. They killed my best friend.